welcome to another edition of the Constitution of American Life with the Friends of Publius. Given the circumstances of the world condition over the last week, I've been searching for some upbeat uh, kind of tunes and stuff to get my feet tapping. And I found that in the super band, the Traveling Woolberries. Now, I know you students probably have no idea who they are, but they're made up of five of the greatest musicians of my generation. Tom Petty, Roy Oberson, Bob Dylan, Jeff Lindsay, and George Harrison. You might have heard of a- Jeff Lynn. A, Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynn. Did I say, what did I say? Lindsay. Lindsay. Lynn. Oh, I said, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff Lynn from ELO uh, there, and uh, they produced an album or two back in the 1990s and uh it's it's snappy it's uh you know got some great lyrics i would have loved to have been in the studio as those guys were working um but listening to their music of course as uh in these days of uh, retirement that i am in i'm the only one of the four of us who is officially retired you did get plenty of time to reflect and uh while listening to their music i was reflecting on a number of things one is only two of those gentlemen are now are still living, uh, which is uh, uh, sad as, uh, as I think about it. Uh, some of the great musical talent that we've lost in the last 10 years or so. Uh, and also I was reflecting about the Friends of Publius and the Constitution of the American Life program and the value it has to me. I've been involved in civic education for nearly 37 years. Most of that with the Center for Civic Ed and the uh, We the People uh, program. And I was thinking about the value of uh, both the organization and that program um, and why I became so enamored with it that I've dedicated so much of my life. Not only does it encourage kids to uh, develop knowledge and skills, but it also pushes teachers. Uh, and it pushes teachers to become better at their uh, craft. And uh, it also, I think in the last analysis, it causes both students and teachers to try to figure out what they believe and what their values and principles are when it comes to the Constitution uh, of the United States uh, there. And so that's the same with this program, the Constitution of American Life. I will say over the, I have no idea, 70, 80 episodes that we've been doing, it has challenged me to clarify my view of the world. Um, I've always seen myself as a principled idealist, which I would like to think that the uh, framers of the Constitution were principled idealists. But I think after so many episodes, I've come to realize that they were probably the first practitioners of realpolitik. Otto von Bismarck gets the credit for that, but I really do believe that the framers were much more grounded in realism than they were in idealism. And I've come to this conclusion that the framers wrote and thought in poetry, but they ended up creating a constitution rooted in prose or realism. And hopefully some of you will understand that reference that I'm making. And so how does that relate to our topic tonight? Well, we're gonna be talking about uh, executive privilege, uh, the origins, purpose, and application of that notion or this notion of executive privilege. And after many hours of reading, I have come to the conclusion that I have no fracking idea, all right, <laughs> about what America stands for vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution. That, uh, you know, that we are, in many ways, we love to talk about our poetry, but we're so very ignorant and naive about our prose and about the reality. And it led me to ask a question, you know, can you have a nation based upon the rule of law when there is no consensus on the law? And in many cases, no way to enforce the law, which is exactly what executive privilege to, to me, uh, reveals. And I would have to agree with Jonathan Schaub. He's a University of Kentucky law professor who said this, executive privilege as it works in practice does not operate as a form of law. The breadth of disagreement about the scope of constitutional doctrine and the malleability of the few relevant judicial precedents allow lawyers and government officials to use executive privilege to justify whatever position is in their self-interest. So in the end, I've come to the conclusion, at least as of today, that we just created a constitution totally based on self-interest. And I want you to think about this, students and teachers. In the last six presidential administrations, 
none of the officials who have defied congressional su subpoenas and so congressional subpoenas and executive privilege as we will talk about are closely tied together but no official in the last six presidential administrations has been held accountable or faced any consequences for defying congressional subpoenas none whatsoever related to executive privilege which is a huge topic uh, today as we're going to talk about and so let's start off as we generally do with kind of a kind of a, just a general introduction uh, and I'm just wondering from uh, gentlemen, the three of you, do you have any uh, comments on anything I said or uh, on this question in general? And do you see any landmines that students and teachers should be aware of? So, Professor Kavanaugh? Uh, well, I would say, Dave, I think our broadcast is done. I think you just you just said, good night, Cleveland. You've been a wonderful audience. Um, I would I would <laughs> I would take exception with the fact that all those guys in the traveling wheelberries were excellent musicians. Uh, they were great songwriters. They weren't great musicians. There were five rhythm guitar players, but uh, that's neither here nor there, given our topic. And that'll uh, be next week, students and teachers, a debate <laughs> over the traveling Wilbur. Okay, go on. Um, Sorry, Chris. No, it's fine. Um, I do think, you know, it, obviously the question starts with the quote, and the quote is from Jefferson. And, you know, so Jefferson is staking out an early ground that, and, and I, I would argue that his predecessor, some tall other Virginian, uh, maybe stake this out earlier as well, that there are certain things that the president, you know, should be able to keep to himself when he needs to and, and some things he can reveal. And I think if you look at the question or if you look at the quote from Jefferson, it really is like Edmund Morgan says about the Constitution in terms of foreign policy. It's an invitation to argument. I think this this idea of this notion of executive privilege, that, again, that is not in the Constitution, is an invitation to argument. I don't know if there are any landmines, though. Okay, Professor Moore? Yeah, I'm going to take exception to most of your introduction, David. Um, <laughs> I think, well, in the form of uh, maybe just uh, some observations, I think it's interesting that, you, uh, that you're quoting a, a law professor weighing in on this. Uh, and I think from a uh, from a political science and a legal framework, I think that quote is probably uh, there's some merit to it. Um, I think a historian might look at these two. Uh, you, and I, li I like the fact that you uh, we've established the fact that, there, that there's two sides of a really squishy coin, frankly. Executive privilege is not textually there and neither is congressional investigation. These are implied things that in, for a historian's point of view is the traditions and how it will evolve fills in the meaning of those things. Uh, for, so for me to hear uh, a political scientist and a lawyer make comments about uh, the troublesome nature of this, I, I guess I, I would push back on that. I don't see either of these, uh, these principles, ex executive uh, privilege or uh, congressional oversight as particularly problematic, uh, I see it much more as inevitable. And in that sense, I think we're a lot more British in the way we do our Constitution than the way um, we may think that our Constitution is this static and principled thing. There's so much, uh, there's so much evolutionary nature to our uh, common law, really, in, in a way evolution of our system. So uh, I guess I'm going to push back that there's a historical argument to be made that all of this is reasonable. And it's a it's a reasonable argument. Maybe I can meet you halfway on that, um, uh, Chris. Okay. Uh, political scientist, uh, rock star Mike Williams, as uh, Professor Moore has dismissed you and uh, your contribution <laughs> uh, here. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I I was trying to dismiss you, David, not not Mike. <laughs> well, I, uh, the, the fun thing is, is I'm neither a political scientist or a historian. I'm just a guy <laughs> off the street. So uh, anyhow, Mike, I uh, I tend to I think the way you framed it as kind of an open and shut case. Um, I, I disagree with that. I think there's a little more nuance, and there's a little more little more things the students can really get into here. So for me, I would expect, I mean, yeah, I think students, this is the kind of question where students can openly, like the question says, do you agree or disagree? 
I, I would say, yeah, both, right? I mean, there's a lot for students to kind of think about here. And the quote by Jefferson, as Chris said, is kind of the starting point. And I, I would say two things at the outset, this notion of public good and this notion of injuring the public, it's a real governmental necessity that anyone who is in government should be having those things on their mind. Now we can debate whether executive privilege is used just to protect self-interest as you kind of alluded to, um, or if, it's, if it can be there to protect the, pu the, the public. And then I would also remind the students that, you know, we live in a representative democracy. So to some extent, maybe our founders overestimated the amount of virtue that we would have in our leaders, but still as members of the public at some level, there has to be some trust that there has to be some discussions that happen at some levels that maybe I'm not privy to because it keeps me and the very system that I love to live under safe. Um, I don't know where the magic sort of balances with that, but I do believe that there is room for that to happen in a representative democracy. So we've already kind of touched on it, Professor Moore, and uh, we've made some reference, but let's get a little bit uh, deeper in this. And that is the idea that the Constitution makes no mention of the concept of executive privilege. And at least based on my, upon my research, there's no explicit reference to this idea until President Eisenhower, uh, who made a reference uh, to it in his administration. So if you could begin our discussion uh, by discussing maybe a little bit of the early history, the principles, foundations for this, what I'll call vague power of executive privilege. Well, I think students would be well advised to look at uh, Locke. Uh, I think it might be chapter, it's one of the teens, uh, maybe 13, 14, 15, where I think the title is On Prerogative. And it's interesting that Locke, who, uh, I mean, he's one of the contractualists, um, he, he emphasizes the supremacy of the legislature, but also is willing to, to carve out this uh, royal prerogative. Um, and, and it's interesting that uh, Mike used the phrase public good. And that's a phrase actually that Locke uses in that chapter on prerogative. In, in other words, the monarch should have this uh, prerogative and it's, it can only be invoked if there's a public good, it cannot be invoked for, for private interest. Now, in full, and then he goes on to this long explanation about, <laughs> and everybody ever since has been trying to determine what public good means. So I, I would suggest it's the, uh, maybe one of the ground zeros to think about as to where this comes from is, is we kind of inherited this idea of executive prerogative, uh, executive privilege uh, from Locke. And I'm also going to uh, suggest that it's around in the colonial era too, and the colonials hate it. Um, I would suggest that students really think about governor, royal governors. None of them are chosen by uh, people. They're appointed by the crown. They're, um, their commissions are public, but there's this interesting thing, but their, their instructions from the crown are not. And that caused a lot of consternation all over the colonies. I mean, <laughs> because they really wanted to know what were in the instructions from the crown to the governor. And, and if you know anything about colonial history, there's always the house uh, the lower houses, uh, if there was, if it was bicameral, always was fighting with the royal governors. Hey, many royal governors never even spent a, a day in the colonies. They sent their lackey, at least some lieutenant governor, to take the heat. Uh, but colonials always were suspicious of these instructions, and they wanted to know what was in them. So, uh, so I guess I'm saying that there's maybe two things to think about where we inherited this this idea that the thing exists this executive prerogative. Uh, I'm saying Locke is a possibility, but also the suspicion of this prerogative occurs in the colonial era. Um, and certainly Lord Dunmore is, is a governor that's a great example of uh, a heavy-handed governor. Uh, I mean, there, there's several of those uh, that really rankles the sensibilities of, of the colonials. So I think that governor instruction thing is important for students to think about as maybe some origins of our, our uh, fears, resentments of 
uh, executive prerogative. Chris or Mike, uh, thoughts on on this? Or well, I, just, think I just would like to ask Tim a follow up um, because I, I think it's fascinating stuff to think about, and I had not really con I didn't understand or considered the idea of uh, royal governors. So my question is a, a, a normative one. Um, should the colonists be able to know what the instructions were? Well, it may it may depend on what kind of charter they had from the beginning, whether it was a royal charter or a. a well, uh, by the time by the time the revolution is rolling right. around, they were all right. royal charters. So, um, well, and that's that's the difficulty of all governors face. I mean, we all know from sixty five to seventy six. Uh, 1765. Yeah, soon. sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, that it's it's next impossible for any kind of uh, any governor in any of the colonies. Uh, to get any control, so uh, so it all boils over in the 1760s. Well, um, but should should the colonists have the right to know what those instructions are? Well, um, yes and no. I, look, I th I think um, I I know that's a that's a really crappy answer, but uh, <laughs> the yes part of me says, look, they're coming from a tradition where it's divine right. Uh, where if you look at that in its pure form, the executive doesn't have to say a damn thing about what they're doing. They're not answerable to anybody. So, uh, so with that tradition, uh, I mean, think about how, <laughs> how there's no insight to executive decision making. Uh, so by the time you get to Locke, where he's, he's, uh, he's at least maintaining some of that, I think it's entirely predictable that there's going to be some executive prerogative in any tradition that comes out of divine right that's what my thought is with Locke is that he's uh doing a little cya with that because he doesn't i mean and he's <laughs> uh, as soon as he's covering his assets um he because he doesn't want to like totally throw the, the the crown under the bus here so he's going to carve out a niche with this royal prerogative right <laughs> this executive prerogative that he speaks of so i i'm i'm not skeptical, but cynical. You, you know, and Tim's comments makes me think about um, the students. Another way to get at this question or to think about this is just how Americans think about the executive more generally. I mean, executive privilege, what we're going to talk about right now is super narrow. But we all know that this cultural norm we have about the executive is really sort of causes a lot of cognitive dissonance for those of us who study this. I mean, Opinion polls tell us that today, Americans generally, you know, depending on which party's in power, but whatever, they want presidents who are going to be super powerful and fix inflation and make gas prices go down, right, in a, in a heartbeat. And we're also super distrustful of presidents who are too ambitious. And we carry those two different things with us um, even today. And what I heard from Tim's statement is that cognitive dissonance has been there from the beginning, maybe. And it's just a thread throughout our history that kind of relates to this executive privilege question. So, Chris, let's get uh, into the specifics about this so-called power. And uh, so under what conditions can this power be used? And what limits are there on executive privilege? And, and, and I guess, and kind of commenting on Tim, I'm assuming, and Chris, I, maybe you can disagree or, or affirm me here, that executive privilege is implicit within the system of separation of powers. That if you're going to have separated powers, the executive branch has to have some zone of private domain or, or privacy or, or whatever. So sure. when can it be exercised and what limits do the other branches or do the can the people expect to be put on this power? Well, I think, and I think you see that very much represented in Jefferson's quote, which is the main part of the question, right? The president has some things that he should be able to, he should be able to hold on to and some things that he needs to reveal. And I would, I guess I would probably fast forward in history to the Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Nixon in 74, because I think that is really the first time that uh, in terms of the legitimacy of this claim. It may have been claimed like Jefferson going all the way back and I think even Washington to a degree, right? And I think every president since then to a degree has made, they might not have called it executive privilege, but they believe that there was a realm that existed unto the executive branch 
and the legislative branch and the judicial branch did not really belong there. Um, but I think what we start to finally see it codified is in U.S. v. Nixon 74. And uh, you end up with like basically a, a four prong, uh, I don't know, late, I don't know how to four prong attempt to try and surround this notion of executive privilege, right? Uh, it's the first time, it's the first time executive privilege is going to be ex expressed by the court, right? Um, it's a warm. Well, yeah, yes and no. I mean, the words, the words, the yes. Words. But but yes. Marshall does it. Marshall does it with Jefferson. He does it in the Burr trial. Yeah, yeah. And and actually, they allude to the Burr. They and in the in the decision, they allude yeah. to Marshall in the Burr trial in U.S. v. Burr, right? Uh, in in terms of uh, that, which you know, this is a this is a big long thread, and I don't want to take all the time, but it's uh, the, and the, you know, the Burger opinion is um, showed. They, I think, three or four times they, they, they're within there. So, the executive privilege is a term used, and Berger, in his opinion, like three or four times says that, however, if you were to claim this for national security, right, <laughs> or foreign policy, then yeah, I think that's a legitimate claim. Uh, the third part of it is the idea that um, this is a chance, this was the court really establishing itself as a power broker in this because now we as a court will determine the extent of this executive power. We're going to limit the executive branch here or we're going to extend the executive branch's power. The fourth part is that, that and they said this in the opinion, and this is where they cited Marshall, is that um, the president is and this is you know david and it's kind of leading for your next question i think but that the president should get a little extra protection when it comes to the courts and uh extra legal protection and this is where they cited marshall and what he had to say um in the, in, in the trial of aaron burr and usv burr right and um and, and burr even even you know excuse me marshall you know, giving a shout out to Jefferson, which actually fast forward then to the Office of Legal Counsel's memo in 1973, which is revisited by the Justice Department in 2000, that a sitting American president can't be indicted or face criminal prosecution, which is nowhere in the Constitution, but they can take that all the way back to, you know, U.S. v. Burr. So I don't know if that answers your question, Dave, but I think for students, well, U.S. being I, I, 74. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously the lead case, but I think as you've alluded to, you know, yeah, the court does some definitional elements here, but, you know, the, they're very squishy on this, which has been the entire history since, is that the court is afraid for some reason to come out and articulate to me, some hard line, you know, principles of, of and here's, here's my example. So you mentioned national security, all right? That- well, I didn't, Warren Burger, Burger did. Warren yeah, Burger. okay, Warren Burger, you know, it, it can be. But the protection does not protect a president when he's acting in his personal capacity. Yet it does protect the president when he's acting in national security. How does a court determine whether something's in their personal capacity and not national security? Well, there's especially, a, there's especially if they don't have the documents to, to analyze whether which is which. <laughs> there's a there's a there's a term students may come across when you're doing a deep dive into this, and it's called um, uh, in camera. And what that means is it's not like because you're using your phone, like the sound effect there. Is the idea is what judges will be able to see in the privacy or privacy of the chamber, right, without being released to the public. And so when they get this in camera information, then the judges then make that determination, which again, David, maybe not answer, doesn't answer your question, but it's again establishing a great deal of power for the courts to be the arbiters in this. Yeah, and I think we're, that's we're, actually I, what happened in the Sinclair case. Uh, in the Washington administration, um, they they had access to the documents uh, rather than being released. Yeah, I, right. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I would just add that 
to what Chris has said, to my understanding is that this is a privilege that's invoked, right? And it's only invoked when another branch of government, Congress, says, we want to hear or see something. And then a president, and according to a 1977 case, right, Nixon v. General Administration, a former Service. president, they can claim that executive privilege. So, it, so the reason we may not have a hard and fast rule, and the reason we don't have a lot of court cases on this is, my understanding is most of these questions over executive privilege have been decided through compromise as the branches work this out, right? Which in, a, in some ways is maybe just the way the system was designed to work with these types of questions. Um, but we could think about all the other kind of episodes we've done and about how the executive branch is so big, so powerful, so many more people. Congress may not even know what questions to ask <laughs> or know that there's a question to be asked. Shocking. I'm shocking <laughs> that you're undervaluing the knowledge of Congress. Well, you know, they're just kind of out there. They're kind of out uh, personnel at this point, it seems to me. But um, so anyways, I just I wanted to point out that it, it's not something that that um, you have to know a little something before you can even ask for something and then it has to be invoked. And then in most cases, it's a compromise. So it just hasn't given the court a lot of examples um, to work this well, out. As a quick follow up. So it protects the executive branch from Congress. It can protect, I guess, to a certain degree, the executive branch from the judiciary, I'm wondering. And does it protect the executive branch from citizens? That is, if I, if I file a Freedom of Information Act claim and I want certain information, it, so it also protects the executive branch from the people themselves. Is that an accurate understanding? Yes, I would agree. Okay. So uh, it, 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 it helps insulate the executive branch, period. Yeah, yeah we're going to get to that. <laughs> so, Mike, and this is one of Chris's favorite uh, topics, uh, and that is the notion of limited government and the rule of law. So it, this is more of a theoretical political science theory question, not political science. Oh, uh, let's oh. get into the numbers and crush numbers. But if liberal democracy depends upon the citizens having information in which to make informed and educated decisions, then how can executive privilege be at all consistent with constitutional government? Well, when you, when you frame the question that way, I thought we were going to be talking about the designated hitter rule and whether oh. I should uh, go to the National League. I thought that was what Chris always wanted to talk about, but I got wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it... Um, um, Help me out, because this is my cynicism. This is why I'm so down on the American Constitution, because, again, there's this principle idealism that we're going to be different than the rest of the world. Look, and David, the is, 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 hold on, is rule of Moore, law a static thing or is it an evolutionary thing? Are you asking me or is that rhetorical? Yeah, because are I you? think I think what I hear in this uh, invoking of rule of law that there's an assumption that it's a static set in stone set of things it is my view has always been that it's not rule of law is an evolutionary thing and there's going to be glitches and it still could be called rule of law but if you see it as static it can't be i understand that that there i'm just saying there's two paradigms in play that's all i'm saying david i think i, I think okay so your question is pretty much like is liberal democracy um, actually a liberal democracy with executive privilege in existence? And I would, I would argue that um, I think there are a lot of threats to American democracy right now. I wouldn't rank executive privilege at the top of my list of what citizens should be worried about. And in terms of having the influence to access government, I think we have citizens have plenty of information <laughs> and I think citizens should think about voting and they should think about working in their states to make sure that voting laws are written in ways so people can vote. I think that they should lobby their government. I think that there are many other ways that can exercise their rights as small d Democrats and keep the democracy functioning even if executive privilege exists because I really do think and I think maybe this is what Tim was maybe alluding to. I, 
I'm kind of in the camp where um, I want an, I want a liberal democracy that can still function. And I don't know what your liberal democracy looks like when um, I get to have access to every communication President Biden is having right now over what's going on in Ukraine. I don't, I don't know how that furthers my knowledge as a citizen to help me make a decision in a real sense. And I don't know if that's good for the democracy. So I, just as I don't believe any rights are absolute, um, I don't think executive privilege is absolute, but I also don't think it should be absolute that there shouldn't be any protections at all. I think for students to consider too, is um, there are other places that the law carves out exceptions, right? Because uh, if you think, and, and, and Mike makes a great point, uh, bringing up a very current issue with President Biden handling the Ukraine crisis now, um, the, 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 the confession to the priest is protected, right? Your conversations with your lawyer are protected. Right. If you have an attorney, there are certain places where this is carved out. And I do believe um, to, to support Mike and, and Tim uh, somewhat that, you know, there are certain things that happen behind closed doors that I'm not sure that we need to be privy to or should we be privy to. So, I mean, there are exceptions carved out in society for these things. So a president should be able to get. Um, an honest assessment from his advisor without his or her advisor having to worry about, oh my gosh, am I going to be called before Congress to have to explain why I suggested, you know, bombing this site kind of thing. Well, and again, I, I struggle with that. So if we look at the, the Cheney case as vice president and his meeting with the energy companies, all right, and Congress wants to investigate for a legislative purpose and also for potential criminal action because of pricing mechanisms that occur after uh, that meeting uh, there. How do you reconcile that? Which, which trumps? Uh, does, you know, there is my problem with the law. And my thing is, you know what? The vice president has to reveal the, the, the communication and what was said in that meeting. Because by the way, there's just no national security issue. Uh, uh, there. How do you respond to that, uh, uh, any of you? Well, I respond that I think the court got it wrong. I mean, the court makes decisions, and, and I, I disagree with the decision in, in uh, Cheney et al. versus U.S. 2004. I, I think that, you know, um, when he's putting together this advisory panel, right, and if, it, if, it's, if it's solely members of the government, then it's protected, but it's not. He's inviting members of other energy companies into this who have a vested interest in this. And I think that I think the court got it wrong. And I know it's a, even a bigger question. Does executive privilege extend to the vice president? Right. So I would that's how I would answer that. And, you know, well, if it cow. exists, he is part of or she is part of the executive branch. So I, I, I'd say, yeah, it does. But your key element there and. What we know is this wasn't the, the, the cabinet, you know, the, the energy department. This, right. was, this was private CEOs, you know, and lobbyists of the energy in industry. And so how can, you know, executive privilege extend to private citizens is, is what bothers me here, especially when it's dealing with legislation. All right. In some form, whether it's executive uh, 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 administrative agencies or congressional law. Not to mention yeah. the fact that Justice Scalia should have recused himself given his personal relationship with Vice President Cheney. But that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> Did he try to shoot him, too? I'm sorry. I'm too sorry. That was off, off base. So, uh, Tim, I, I think this leads uh, to a question for you uh, here. And. I'm wondering, because like I said, I'm having a real problem, and I was upfront about it at the beginning of this program with this whole idea of executive privilege. Um, so isn't executive privilege, the way it has been used, especially since Nixon uh, on, just an extension of executive immunity in that it establishes a specific limit on congressional legislative oversight authority, as well as the right of the president and high level White House officials to withhold information from Congress, the judiciary, and ultimately the public. What they're saying is we're immune, all right, from, to me, one of the most fundamental principles, and that is an open society, openness of information, access to information, and they're saying we're immune from that, 
All right. And so this is just some extension of executive immunity. Um, I, I would I would agree wholeheartedly. And I and I would agree that, uh, with Chris that uh, the court got it wrong in the Cheney case. But, but uh, there's something interesting, I think, uh, on your either your comment or Chris's, uh, does it extend beyond the, actually the president? And, and that was a part of the J Treaty problem, too. Because Congress wanted to see uh, all the papers that everybody, uh, everybody's papers in that negotiating process that they had with Great Britain. So that issue of does it extend beyond literally just the singular president to uh, to members were um, to his cabinet. So that that comes up very early. So that in a way that shouldn't surprise us. That extension of the uh, the, the question of does this squishy uh, power or right even uh, is, does it expand? It makes it even worse, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's there's been pre my the way I look at it, and I'm really on shaky ground here because we're in presentism. But it does bother me that there is a lack there's not even an effort to explain the public good there's no there's no effort to explain uh i mean and again Locke articulated that that there is there is a uh, a niche for executive prerogative but it has to be for the public good and, and what i hear a lot come out of, of the executive office in the last six administrations very little i mean i can't even get through reading it with a straight face what's the public good uh so so i think it falls down at a theoretical level um in spite of all the legal wrangling yeah that really does and we've we've tried to touch on this numerous times in, in this day and age professor moore is the public good going to be determined by polling <laughs> I mean, yeah, how, they, yeah. I mean, how do we? How do we? It was supposed to be determined theoretically, if I understand any of the Federalist Papers, through representation, yeah, and their votes in Congress and and things like that. But uh, that doesn't happen too often, and uh, you know. So I'm just wondering: is the public good? And it's all three of you. Is it determined by you know by polling? data is that the way we determine it these days and therefore if the president knows that he's got the public behind him he can claim executive privilege on anything you know because uh, this president's running into problems with executive privilege and i think part of what he's running into problems with is is polling all right i, I don't trust the courts at all to be able to deal with this issue so i'm just wondering uh, you know and i i maybe have gone all over the place. Uh, well, and I think the courts are ill-equipped to handle this too, because because um, you know Hamilton's probably right that it's the weakest branch. But you guys, uh, you guys all push back on my opening statement. But that's where executive privilege, and you said it to begin with, Professor Moore, that executive privilege has been given to the hands of the judiciary to adjudicate because of the ambiguity, the vagueness, the absence of any kind of constitutional language, we're gonna let the court decide, but the courts don't wanna decide. And so we, the people are, where are we at with all this? Well, I, I, I would like to naively suggest that maybe Congress ought to grow a pair and, 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 uh, and really exercise their prerogatives and, and test, test this investigation principle that's not in the constitution either. I mean, it's, it, 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 every, yeah. the problem is you've set we've set up a system with three coord, uh, coordinate powers, three separate branches, all claiming powers, and they're naturally going to clash. Uh, so I think we've set we've set the system up for these fights, and the court really is is in a bad position to really fight with the other heavyweights, frankly. Well, and, and part of the problem is in, in where we are these days is that, you know, going back to Mr. Madison, and he believed that institutional jealousy, right? He was, in, uh, given our prior conversation, uh, Madison was an institutionalist, and he believed the institution of Congress was going to do what they could to rein in the institution and the executive, and the executive being the institution that he is, or she is. Uh, um, will do everything it can to keep his power, right? Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Uh, as students that are listening to this, Fed 51, which you, you should all know that by now, right? So we've moved away from this idea of institutional jealousy or institutional uh, loyalty to party loyalty. And therein lies the problem. 
that Congress will not grow a set anytime soon, unfortunately, but they probably should. David, you mentioned earlier about uh, people denying subpoenas, right? There's no one's suffered a paid a penalty. Uh, as I understand the law, and I will defer to the lawyer in the group, Mr. Uh, Williams, but um, Congress could send the sergeant at arms and arrest people for denying subpoenas. That's Thank a dead you. power. That's a dead power, though. That's a power that Congress has abdicated. Now well, they could it's, reclaim it. It's but not dead. It. it just needs to be resuscitated. Yeah. So they still have the power. They've chosen not to use it because in Tim's words, they need to grow a set. So if you're really worried about, you know, this institutional power that you should be worried about as a member of Congress, then you should be willing to, you know what? We sent you a subpoena. It's a legitimate subpoena. We asked you to come here and give testimony and you're going to deny that. Well, simple. We'll arrest you for denying that subpoena. But we won't because there's party loyalty now over institutional loyalty. Professor Williams, any thoughts on this? Because you got referenced as the lawyer in the group, but I saw you shake your head like not really. But uh, <laughs> yeah, any I'm thoughts? Not that, but um, I mean, your initial question was, how do we know the public good? or something along those lines. And I don't know, I, as I was thinking about that, it's like, okay, so what's, what's the purpose of government? What's the purpose of our government? And I think you and Tim and Chris make a good point. I mean, at the very least, it should go like this, like Congress should say, executive branch, we want this information for you because we think it's in the public good for this reason, right? And the public good may be because we feel we fear that somebody's rights have been violated or we fear that there's been an abuse of power. And then the executive branch needs to respond in some way of like, you know what, I'm, I'm invoking executive privilege um, because for the safety of the military, the safety of those working and undercover, right, abroad, I can't share that information without risking their lives. And then I do think it is like, I think the fact that we have so few cases is a testament to the court, I think rightfully so, wants to stay out of these matters. And they really want the two branches to come together and to try to work out a compromise. And my understanding has been that, again, that's the way most of this has been resolved. That, that's why we have so few court cases, but I could be wrong on that history. No, you're not, you're not wrong on that. And, uh, I'll grant you that historically that may have been true, but uh, you know, in the in in the twenty first century, that's yeah. begun to fragment and fall apart here. And especially in the current situation, we all understand maybe the purpose of this question and why it's being asked of students at this time and place is the controversies that have engulfed the three branches. And uh, it, with this notion of executive privilege, because it's now been exercised, all right, uh, by the former president, so so more so much more frequently than any other president that I know of in American history. The only time that President Obama, you know, uh, uh, claimed executive privilege was the Fast and Furious uh, issue. But I, I can't. I don't have enough digits to count how many times that uh, president number 45 and now former president number 45 has claimed executive privilege. So, so I agree with you, Mike, that you're, you're right, but he, that's my problem. And it, okay. it leads to the next question. I'm trying to rephrase the question to Chris, because I think we've, we've kind of uh, talked about this, but I, I refer to the most recent decision of Thompson versus Trump with the National Archives. All right, you know, and 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 that's what throws me into a tizzy. Is if students and teachers, if you haven't noticed, I'm in a tizzy right now, or apoplectic, or something like that. Apoplectic. But accused, yeah, that one too. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've been accused of uh, in in the past. But in, in 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 Trump versus Thompson, which dealt with the National Archives, what in the he double tooth toothpicks is that all about? I can understand executive privilege in a wartime in, you know, I'm a little bit more fuzzy when it comes to covert operations, things like that, you know, but executive privilege with presidential papers and the Presidential Records Act and stuff. What is this all about, Chris? I mean, this is my problem. 
with the courts. Can you give me any reference? Nixon did not play, you know, lay it out for us. Well, the, uh, Nixon, Nixon reached out from beyond the grave, man. If you think about, I mean, with his lawyers, they, he was, he was dead and they're still trying to hold on to certain things that could and cannot be released. Eventually he will, he, he's, he's no longer alive, but they lose that as that stuff is released. And, and you made David, David, you made reference to the uh, presidential records act, right? Which requires, you know, and this, this stems from Nixon and Watergate. And we see it coming in at the same time that, okay, these papers, these records created by the executive branch, they belong to the people, not to the president. And the students, if you want to really get your mind wrapped around some crazy stuff, go back and take a look at all the stuff that Nixon claimed was his when he left office. The, the list is incredible in terms of papers, uh, tapes, and other things. But what you're happening here is you see the, the Trump administration trying to claim executive privilege in releasing the documents uh, surrounding the January 6th, right? Hold on just a second, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, but you see him trying to hold on to these documents around the January 6th uh, assault on the Capitol um, because, I, you know, the claim, there's no claim of, you know, foreign policy. There's no claim of national security. And I think this is why uh, the district court in D.C., uh, you know, they sided with the, the you know, and the, Obama, the Biden administration it was a 68 page decision which by the way i've read it it is very detailed it does uh, and by the way it's written by the nominee to the supreme court miss jackson it lays out some more finite parameters of executive privilege than i've ever seen and yet kavanaugh and the court reject no relation it. Huh? no relation not, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> you lost me there for a moment. I never even put the two together, but I, I see it now. Uh, but uh, Justice Kavanaugh uh, and, and the court said, this is non-binding dicta, i.e. this is not precedence. Well, That's what they said when they affirmed the appellate court decision. Well, which on, means that all, all they did, they didn't rule on, the, 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 they did not rule on the constitutionality of the claim. They simply did not invoke uh, a stay, right? So the idea is that if the Supreme Court steps in and says, okay, um, you can't surrender these records until we rule, right? They didn't do that. They said, you will surrender the records. So those records need to be surrendered. Right. Even though I think uh, the the court ruled in fa they agreed with the district court and Kavanaugh. They did. Yes. Kavanaugh but, then, but they said that her the, her not that the court's written decision is non-binding. It's not precedence. And, well, uh, and see, this gets us back to the court. The, the Supreme Court is an institution of precedence. They rule. Then it goes down the line to appellate courts and just, you know, that's, that's the whole point of a, of a Supreme Court. Well, David, it is until it isn't. I mean, I mean, no, that's a cop out. But yeah, well, the, the court, so the court says, you know, the Supreme Court agrees with the, the lower court, the D.C. Court of Appeals, and says, okay, you know, we're not going to put a stay in here. So you've got to surrender the stuff. Kavanaugh writes a concurring opinion. Again, Kavanaugh with a K, no, no uh, relation. I do like beer too, but that's another story. Um, so he writes a concurring opinion agreeing. And I think Justice Thomas is the only one that would have granted uh, the stay. He would have said, you know what? You don't have to release this stuff. And this is, if you read uh, the, the Trump administration or if you read President Trump's uh, lawyers, what they claim, there's no claim of national security or foreign policy. So I don't see, given the precedent that they, 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 you mentioned, I don't see when this finally gets adjudicated at the Supreme Court level, which it will, that his executive privilege claims will hold up. Well, the other claim to executive privilege is the, the, the general function of separation of powers. So a president is talking to their secretary interior, they're getting advice, all right, on certain policy. Sure they can claim executive privilege. 
But in this situation, that doesn't apply in any way. And there's my problem, Chris, is by the court proclaiming non-binding dicta that this is non-presidential, not presidential, precedential. There's no precedent here. That's been the problem ever since Nixon versus United States, is the court refuses, although the appellate court did, all right, carve out very clear boundary lines of executive privilege. The Supreme Court refused to accept that, all right, as precedent. And therein lies my question to you, Mike, are we, I mean, are, you know, has this grown? Because I'll agree with Professor Moore, I'll agree with all of you. Early history, Washington, although I find irony in Jefferson's quote being used here, uh, I hope everybody does find some irony in that when it comes to the Burr trial uh, and things. But you know, early history, I, I would agree that th this notion that the two branches could work together, but in the 21st century, given the politics that we face, Mike, don't you agree that this notion of privilege has become a very dangerous so-called principle of our constitutional system? Or you think I'm being to I mean, the sky is falling. I do. I mean, I, I, I'm, I haven't been convinced. I've been listening and I'm trying to think, what am I missing? Um, I think it could be. I think it could be. But I, I mean, this is what I found in my research. And please, someone correct me if I, I don't have this right. But Clinton invoked executive privilege 14 times. President Bush, six times. Obama, a couple times. And I guess I'm not as excited about all this because there's just not a lot of action. I mean, if we're talking about executive orders, and do I think executive orders in some way threaten the balance of power that are like hundreds of those being issued, that's a different discussion for me. But this is about, again, a branch of government asking for something and the president saying no, like saying, I, I, I invoke executive privilege, make me, or let's talk about it, or let's work out a compromise, or let's do something. So I don't, I don't think that separation of powers is at stake. I, what does worry me, maybe you can clarify this, is I, I can hear you, you're wanting the court to play a bigger role, maybe the court to come up with a, a simple test. The minute this becomes the, when the court leans into it like that, <laughs> then a president would just need to make sure that he had the right people or she had the right people on the court to make sure that things would go his or her way. And, and, and I just, I'm, I'm a little, I feel a little better about just letting the branches behind closed doors work, given that it's only happened a few times, right? I'm more confident with that than opening this up where the Congress could never do it because there's a majority in the court where the president knows they're always going to side with me. So, I, but maybe I'm, I really do trust your opinion on so many matters, David. It makes me feel odd that I, I, I'm not biting this. The world is, the sky is falling, but I might be missing something. Well, I, it's nice to affirm uh, my uh, being the, you know, outside the box guy amongst this group. But here, here is my dilemma. Uh, okay. You've got a shirt. Think outside the box. Okay. Wow, I didn't know that, uh, students and teachers, and see, that's how mind-melded the four of us are. But here's my dilemma. W one of the problems we're seeing right now, and, and that's why this question has been asked, I believe, I have no affirmation, confirmation, that that's why this question has been asked, but it's because of the current situation. Because of the very existence of executive privilege, all right, and it's going to be adjudicated through the federal courts, it allows presidents to draw out the process to the very point that it becomes moot, all right, because, or mute, which one is it? Moot? Moot. 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 Because, all right, of, of our political seasons and stuff. And that's what we're exactly seeing, whether Steve Bannon or others filing lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit claiming executive privilege, there will be no accountability. There will be no justice, all right, when it comes to January 6th and the issues surrounding that because of this notion of executive privilege and the failure of the courts 
to confront it head on. That's why, Mike, I think we're in very dangerous territory. Thoughts, anybody? Or, and again, am I as crazy as I seem to be on screen? <laughs> Well, well I, I, I think your point, I think your point about um, the dragging it out is, is, uh, is well made. And, and I would actually say that's the bigger problem, not privilege itself. So, I, I mean, I would agree with you on that. Chris? Well, I, 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 it's frustrating. Yeah. But again, um, if we believe in due process of law and these avenues are open to people and they can afford the attorneys that will do this, then it's hard to say that, you know, you can't pursue these legal challenges, which yes, drag it out, right? Uh, if we were to tell these people that you, you had to use a public defender, um, it might actually go a little faster, but that's a denial of due process rights. Um, it is frustrating to be sure, but um, I think it goes back to my prior comment in terms of institutional loyalty versus party loyalty, if Congress were to be serious about its investigatory power and work together, I think we could get to answers quicker. But we know that um, parties will protect party members now. Well, they there's actually, and, and you know, I think you know this, there's actually legislation out there called the Protection uh, Protect Our Democracy Act. Uh, which would actually fast track, fast track, you know, cases like this in the federal judiciary, and you know, and say they need to put these at the forefront and rule relatively quickly on questions in which the executive branch is claiming privilege and trying to stop congressional uh, investigation. So you know, maybe in the end, Tim is absolutely right that uh, this whole problem and 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 my tizzy that I'm happy having is not really with the executive branch, it's really with the legislative branch and their failure failure to statutorily uh, uh, deal with this. Uh, you agree, Tim, that that's yeah. in the last analysis, whatever Ooh. problems we have with this notion of privilege, which Mike says is, says is very, you know, very narrowly used, that it actually comes down to the legislative branch? I do. I think it's a failure. And, and there's a raft of uh, political scientists I mean, there's a cottage industry of writing about the the failure of Congress. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it is a congressional issue. I, and maybe maybe it's a failure of imagination because what what I hear you saying, David, is that when you read this question, you don't read the Thomas Jefferson quote. You're thinking about what you called justice for what happened on January sixth, and that that's that a lot of this question is about January sixth and about are we going to have you just use the word justice. And you know, the late great Desmond Tutu from South Africa has really influenced the way I think about justice and that, that there's different types of justice, you know. Um, retributive justice is one type of justice for sure. Um, but restorative justice is another. And, and not that I'm confident that Congress or right now any other body has the political will or resources to do this, but a full accounting for what happened, um, a process where the truth comes out, where it's a historical record, where my kids' kids can read something that maybe in that time there'll be something as the objective truth they'll believe in and know what happened and who we think was behind it. And that is a form of justice as well. Um, maybe not the kind of satisfying one that maybe some of us would like for January 6th, but it is a, it is a type. Right, because I fall back on justice delayed as justice denied. And this isn't just an American issue. This is a global liberal democracy issue. And that is privilege. And I don't know how it's defined. And maybe, Mike, I should have asked you how this is defined in other liberal democracies that are much more of a parliamentary. But I know in England, it's state secrets uh, acts. You know, And so they can get away with so many violations of civil liberties and stuff by saying it's national security. All right. And, and we've done that. We know that we're facing a problem now, but we also faced a problem in the 1950s with the national security uh, issue. And a number of things that until the church committees, the church committee of the night of 1970, what was it? Three, four, I don't remember what year the church committee until then we had no idea what our government was doing on our behalf 
behind the scenes internationally because it was all protected by executive privilege. And, 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 and again, that's where my problem uh, is, is here, is you'll say restorative justice, and I say that that just leads to justice delayed, which is justice denied, the, the people who are being hurt. And right now, I believe the American people are being hurt by these claims of executive uh, privilege being issued by the former president. Now, so any closing statements on uh, uh, the rest of you about executive privilege, things we might have missed because of uh, my frenzy? Well, I, I would have uh, students really look at some of the Federalist Papers. It, it strikes me as the Federalists are extremely naive to say uh, this prerogative um, wouldn't evolve into something uh, as draconian as David has described it. Uh, the Anti-Federalists are onto something here because they... Um, you know, <laughs> they use the word prerogative in the sense that this is going to be royal prerogative, this presidency. So they use that word and they use it pejoratively, whereas the Federalists want to soft pedal it. You know, uh, uh, that the prerogative is, is, isn't that bad. So it is it is interesting to me that the Federalists, in my estimation, have it totally wrong and the anti-Federalists have it totally right how it will evolve. Um Another thing I would uh, I would stress is that um, you know one of the things maybe we have and then maybe this is the schmaltzy part of the hour it it strikes me as it's amazing to me how virtuous the early presidents were when they really didn't want to turn stuff over to, to Congress they went ahead and did it I mean even Jackson's for heaven's sake. Does it in the bank? I mean, Congress wanted a lot of bank documents when he was going to pull the money. I mean, the, the virtue of those guys when they actually did turn over stuff, that's amazing. I mean, it, it just seems like it's from another planet that a, that a president would do that. And so I can't help but think of the pettiness uh, of the modern presidents um, on, on this issue. Um, it, so, so this, this virtue really is, to me, that's, that's, um, I mean, you're, you're pretty worked up David tonight about uh, executive privilege, but to me, the virtue piece of it is where I would get worked up. Thank you, Chris. Closing thoughts. Um, well, we went from squishy to schmaltzy. So <laughs> we're going to add schmaltzy to our vocabulary of apoplectic. Um, that was impressive. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I get worked up a little bit about it um, in terms of the, the the fact that there's not it's really it's it's kind of kind of like Potter Stewart. I, I know executive privilege when I see it um, and there is not a hard and fast rule in terms of executive privilege and the court gets to determine that, which be, which can be frustrating to be sure. But I do think, even though it's not specifically mentioned, I do believe that there should be times when the president and his staff should be able to, to not have to disclose things. Um, I don't think that in terms of the modern sense of what we're talking about with January 6th, I don't think this is one of those things. I don't think uh, President, former President Trump's claims of executive privilege hold water in this case, especially based on the precedent that's been established that in prior cases that we mentioned. Um, so it's just it's just part of the process, I think. It's just part of the, I know that's a really a cop out, and I apologize to the students and teachers watching. But it, the idea of these claims is just it's part of the process. I mean, we call them framers for a reason, right? Like framing a house, we we frame it, and then we just got to continually work on the construction. It's like watching the HGTV channel. Mike. No, I don't. I don't have anything to add. That was. That was I think we should end with that. <laughs> Is that all right? Can I do that? Uh, well, yeah. You must have a date or something. I don't. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I could say something that would be really witty, and smart, but I don't. I think we've said it all. Well, I uh, I'm going to concur with uh, with with Professor Moore here uh, to some degree. And, and, and the naivete to some degree, I do think it is ultimately about 
to some degree, they had faith in virtue of political representatives. And, and maybe that is the, the, the fault that they, they, they obviously they could not anticipate uh, in any way, shape or, or form there. Uh, it's obviously a, a problem with Congress and, uh, and, you know, uh, and I liked your reference, Tim, to early presidents. And, and Mike, you talked about it as well as, you know, even up till Nixon, you know, uh, you know, that Congress and the president kind of did work this out. And maybe that's why there's not the judicial uh, history that, uh, that I was hoping to find uh, in my uh, research uh, here. Um, uh, and we're in a different time and place, uh, that's uh, for sure. Um, but uh, I do want kids to, uh, and teachers to, to really think critical about this because in the last analysis, I'm sorry, openness you know, is the oxygen of liberal democracy. And we got to be very careful of what we allow our political leaders to keep privileged. And I'm not opposed to privileged information, all right? But like Chris said, I think I know it when I see it, you know? Uh, in fact, I'm rather surprised how open the Biden administration's been about, you know, the Ukrainian situation, the stuff they've shared as far as intelligence and stuff like that. Now, I know that there's, uh, I'm, I'm a cynical as the rest, that there's a political purpose that they're doing that. But I just, I just, I'm really concerned given what we are facing uh, in the 21st century, uh, especially with the, the global turn towards authoritarianism. So I, you know, I, I'm sorry for being, uh, you know, a little bit frenzied and epileptic ap 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 or something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, there. Uh, but like I said, I, I, I actually immersed myself in reading this entire last week about this issue and it's just my blood pressure rose and rose the entire time. Well, students and teachers, I hope you did, uh, are able to, to garner some useful material from our discussion uh, tonight. Uh, next uh, session, we are going to be going back to unit one and I find this ironic given our conversation, but we're going to be dealing with a quote by John Adams and the notion of rule of law which is uh, Professor Kavanaugh's favorite subject. So we'll be looking to him to be leading the discussion uh, here uh, and whether or not the rule of law is embedded in our founding documents. And as I said in the opening, it can be written all over the place, but it doesn't really mean much unless the culture itself uh, has uh, inculcated the values of the written word uh, into our daily lives. Until that next discussion, Peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bye.